Hello. Uh, I wanted to do this video um, to get a little personal. It's a uh, let's get real kind of thing. And it's about me. So, occasionally you'll see my eyes glance down at my notes here. Because uh, I'm not sure the best way to do this. So I, I make notes. So, let's uh, start at the beginning. Uh, childhood. How, how far back can you remember? I, I think the older you get, the harder it is to remember the way back. <laughs> so, let's see how far back I can go. Are you ready? Do you have your coffee handy? I may occasionally have a sip of coffee while I'm doing this, just to wet my whistle. So let's go back to my first home. Um, not my first home, it was my parents' first home in uh, Ecorse, Michigan. The address was 21 Apple Grove. And the phone number was 3810937. I remember that from the 60s. I remember that. It's burned into my head. I remember my first girlfriend, Teresa. I won't give her last name. Um, but I was like six years old, I think, when we moved from Ecorse to Lincoln Park. And I remember hearing that Teresa had showed up at my house after I moved out, only to discover that her boyfriend was long gone. I'm sorry, Teresa. Sorry. The second home was just a, a city away in Lincoln Park, Michigan. I remember uh, Mom and Dad looking for homes, and I don't recall any other home but this one when they took us, I'm not sure if it was us, I know I was there, I think one of my brothers or sister was there, but we got to uh, romp through the house and discover this new place. Um, I don't, uh, I, I, think, I think they had already purchased the house and, and we were just getting our first looks at it as a family, so. Uh, again, six, maybe six years old. Can you remember that far back? Uh, school was a treat. Uh, Mom walked me to school the first couple of days, and then she set me loose after that. I fought my way tooth and nail. Uh, I, I did not want to go to school. I did not want to leave home. I was used to sitting at home, playing in the yard, uh, eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, watching Yogi Bear and, and uh, you know, cartoons on TV in the living room, family room. So this was all new to me as well. The house was, the house was cool, but school was not. Didn't care for that at all. Uh... I uh, remember being uh, bullied in my later years, uh, fifth, sixth grade. Kids would, uh, and, it, and it only took one kid to uh, force me to bring him bubble gum for a few other punk-ass bullies to pile on. And before I knew it, I was stealing money, money and uh, going to the penny candy store to buy them Bub's Daddies. Now, if you don't know what Bub's Daddies are, well, let's take a trip down memory lane. They were long uh, rope gum. It didn't It was just a big, long piece of gum and a long wrapper. They had different flavors. Bub's Daddies. Oh, though they were good. And uh, so I'd steal money wherever I could find it. 
just so I wouldn't be dead after school. It was scary. I was scared to death. Eventually, um, after coming home crying, uh, after um, my mom confronting the mother of the bully and the bully and the bullying not stopping, I finally got fed up one day, and uh, Michael Gearhart bullied me one too many times. You're dead after school if I don't have my bubble gum. <laughs> and I chased him out the door when the bell rang. I piled up on him and beat the living shit out of him. And the bullying stopped. I felt good, yet I felt like a bully myself. And I didn't like that feeling. Uh, I found a friend in... in uh, elementary school. His name was Billy Bearden. Billy was nothing but trouble. Nothing but trouble. Oh, before we go any further, remember where I am, Billy. This is a, a tribute to my dad. I bought this hat from my dad a few years before he died um, because he did serve in the Korean War. And I remember him uh, being interested in where a gentleman found a hat just like this. Uh, so I found it for him and bought it for him. And I think he wore it the one day I gave it to him. And it ended up in his coat closet. Where it sat for the rest of its life until he died. So I snatched it back. And now I have it. This is a tribute to my dad. He passed away a couple of years ago. And I miss him dearly. So anyway. My friend Billy Bearden was a troublemaker. He got kicked out of a couple of schools prior to being put into public school from his parochial school he was in. But I found him amusing, and uh, I loved the mischievousness about him. So I became friends with him. I used to go home for lunch in 5th, 6th grade, because uh, we were allowed to, to go home for lunch. And we had peanut butter and cinnamon and sugar sandwiches. Nothing like feeding your kid <laughs> high-octane uh, stimulants before going back to school for the second half of the day. But that's what we did. I can't imagine why he was so poorly behaved. He eventually got kicked out of that school, too. But he had a twin brother, Roger, and Roger and I became fast friends. Um, I loved that boy, that man, and we were best friends for a long time, a long time. Um, let's talk about brothers and, and, and sister. I have two brothers, Dan and Rick, and my sister Mary Lou, she passed away a long time ago. Um, I have to say I was closest to her as far as my siblings go for most of my life. Um, mom and Dad, they were always Mom and Dad. They were always there. They weren't the best parents. They weren't surely weren't the worst parents. They were, are my heroes. Um, uh, Roger uh, and I hung out every available moment we could. Uh, apparently, my mom and dad liked Roger, so I was allowed to hang out with them. But you had to be home before the streetlights went on. <laughs> and don't be late, or you'll get grounded. That's just how it was. We didn't have smart devices, cell phones. Uh, iPads, uh, Walkmans. We didn't have anything. Nothing. We had a stick. We had bikes. And we had the best time the kid could have. Oh, and we had boundaries. 
and rules that we had to follow. Gosh, it was it was so terrible. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Uh, my brother, my brothers, my two older brothers always ditched me at every chance they could. They didn't want to hang out with the little Mitchie. They wanted to go out and do other things, maybe pick up some chicks, and they weren't going to pick any chicks up with me tagging along. And my sister, she loved having me around, so that's why we were close. I know I'm, I'm bouncing back and forth here. There were a few little loves uh, during that time. There was Lori and Debbie and Oh, there were a couple other ones that, you know, young love, young like. But then in high school, I met Tammy. She was my first love. We were about, I think, a year or two apart. So she was a little younger than I was. But when I graduated in 79, I felt uh, ignored in my family. And uh, I decided that I was going to move in with Tammy and her mom and her alcoholic, abusive father and a uh, few siblings of her own who had some challenges, if you will. From beginning to end, we were together about four years. And... Uh, after she graduated from high school, she went to college and discovered uh, better men than me, apparently, and uh, decided that she wanted to have uh, extracurricular relationships. She was nice enough to, to uh, tell me up front. She didn't lie to me. She didn't uh, cheat on me. She thought we could contain our relationship in a lesser capacity while she had other relationships, and I would have none of that, so I, I bailed. At that time, I was living with her. I was a security guard. I was a Pinkerton. That's like, I think, one of the first police forces in the world, <laughs> or in, a, in, in the States there, anyway. And I was driving a 65 Chevy Impala. It was beat up pretty good. But uh, that was uh, an interesting time. I was broken hearted for quite a while. Uh, from the Chevy, I went to the Le Mans. I remember the Chevy Le Mans. Pontiac, sorry. I'm an idiot. <laughs> the Chevy uh, was a 65 Chevy Impala Super Sport. It had a 327 small block four barrel. I have no idea what that means. The Pontiac Le Mans was cool. Uh, I remember going on summer vacation and joining my mom and dad up north. And I left the car parked in the in the alley behind the house. And when we came back, there were dozens of little pot plants about that big growing up out of the carpeting in the car. That was cool. <laughs> but one day, uh, while actually living... Uh, away from home, I uh, snuck into Mom and Dad's house and stole the gremlin, Mom's Black Betty, and totaled it. Didn't eh, I, I guess I kind of totaled it. It was repairable. It was repaired, and I ended up getting the car. Uh, I paid for it, but in more than one way. But I, I got it. I, I was surprised that when I told Dad that I'd wrecked the gremlin. The first thing he said was, was anybody hurt? That's all he gave a shit about. I found an old Ford van, big window van, it had two gas tanks in it. And uh, I decided that I wanted to be a disc jockey. So... Uh, 
my next door neighbor, uh, a family member of theirs had a business and they decided they were going to open a Simonizing business, they called it. It's where they just kind of detail cars and they were going to have a grand opening. So they rented a bunch of high powered amplification equipment and I gathered all of my music and records and stuff and we had a big party in the store parking lot. The store folded within a week. <laughs> But it was a good time, and it sealed my interest in becoming a disc jockey. So I remember at that time uh, I had a paper route. It made good money, believe it or not. Yeah, a newspaper route. Maybe you don't know what that means. <laughs> Some of you do. Newspapers are big sheets of paper with news in it, and you would read it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, one morning I was walking by a local bar front and the sign had changed from nightly DJ to DJ Wanted or whatever and I walked in there and said, hey, I, I'm a DJ and I wasn't. But I had aspirations and they hired me on the spot. So I borrowed a few bucks from mom and went out and bought all the top 40 hits I could afford for, I don't know, 20 or 30 bucks and set up my equipment and for the next oh must have been six months or so I, I played in that bar and I took that bar from you know a couple of local town drunks to a happening dance place um, and when the gentleman hired me he told me you know if I took care of him and brought him a clientele that he'd, he'd give me more money and he never did so I fired him <laughs> I left I left went to another bar that paid more and played there and then went to another bar that paid more and I did that four or five times different bars different clubs it was like I was on tour I had a partner with me he was a he was a fun guy turned out to be a real not fun guy. I'm trying to be nice. The profanity factor for me, it's it's really hard for me to not use it. So, sorry. I got a job at a gas station, a beer store, at lots of bar gigs, and after that girl broke my heart, when she graduated high school, went to college, the bar gigs was just what I needed because there was a lot of chicks in my life then. We used to, uh, all right, so this is where it gets kind of sketchy. We hosted wet t-shirt contests. And uh, <laughs> at first we jokingly said the winner gets to go home with the DJ. Well, that happened, and it was, I mean, uh, just think of, of Motley Crue, Kiss, uh, Ted Nugent, any, any kind of uh, rock star, and the escapades they may have had after the show, we did that, we did that. <laughs> um, even though we did that, Every girl that I was with, I couldn't help but taking their first name and putting it next to my last name and thinking, I wonder if this is the one. I wonder if this is the one. I always, always wanted to have a partner in my life. I didn't want to have girls. I wanted a girl. Uh... I found one. <laughs> I was doing uh, singing telegrams in a gorilla suit of one of the many jobs that I did. I was Bongo the Gorilla. And uh, I uh, performed for a young lady's... <sighs> must have been... 17th birthday party or something. A couple years later, I run into this girl at a gig. And then, not long after that, 
she was with child, and we were married. Not long after that, we were divorced, and I had a child. She basically abandoned the child. She wasn't equipped to raise a child at that point in her life, and, and I wanted a wife and child. I wanted what my parents had. So I had part of that. I was kind of content. And I was um, dedicated and responsible. I, I knew what I did was pretty monumental, and I had, to, uh, I had to back it up. I had to take care of what I did. So I did. I became a father. Loving, caring, providing. That was uh, that was right about when my sister died. She um, passed away from lymphoma, and so I had the loss, the divorce of my first wife, a child, and the death of my sister on my plate that I was dealing with. And I knew that the bar gigs was probably not what I should be doing. Um, so I decided that I was going to do prize, some private parties and got into doing weddings and stuff, which was a lot more lucrative. Didn't take long. I had a clientele. I had a reputation, a good one. And I had a couple other fellas working for me. So we were making some pretty good money. Uh, and then I found an another wife at, at another gig. And... Within a couple of years, we were married. We tried and tried and tried to have kids. Didn't work out. So we stopped trying, and then we had a kid. <laughs> That's how that works. That marriage lasted quite a bit longer, probably 10, 12 years. We sold our house in Lincoln Park that we had bought and moved to northern Michigan. Her dad tagged along. Uh, he helped out a lot, but he was always, always in our life. And he basically ruined our marriage. I don't want to get too personal about that, because it's just ugly. But I did get a job at a radio station while I was married. Uh, four stations, as a matter of fact. There was... Two stations at one location and two stations at another. I had uh, a job producing a talk show. I was a talk show host myself. I did commercial production, and I was actually a sales manager. And then I quit that job because, mm, again, it got ugly. Uh, the owner of the station was sending salespeople into my territory without telling me, and I didn't like it, and uh, I told him to take this job and shove it. Because I was just getting back into the DJ business up here, up north, so I didn't need it. But my wife looked down upon me for quitting a lucrative job because I was miserable in it. She would have rather I made money and be miserable than um, not work that job. And she was a little uh, regretful at the time, too, back then when we were married, because I could make in, you know, in one night, which she, she took a week to make. I had a lot of fun enjoying that lifestyle, but she was jealous of it and never let me forget about it. Oh, well. We got divorced. She had been threatening me with divorce for several years. And I told her I'd never divorce her. Well, she finally divorced me. She served me papers. I was relieved. I'm like, thank God. I don't get married to get divorced. I will not divorce. I don't do that. You do that. I don't. So she did that. And I was out. And I was miserable. Couch surfing, living out of a duffel bag, 
she had everything I owned. I'd lost basically everything I owned twice to two different wives. Don't, don't, well, uh, no woe is me. It's not what this is all about. It's just life. Life sucks sometimes. So she was supposed to sell the house, split the proceeds with me, and after 10 years of being divorced, I finally said, hey, I'm going to uh, take you to court because you are not, you are in violation of our divorce judgment. And I, that fire I put under her ass got her moving and sold the house or whatever she did and got, got me the portion of money due to me. And I was finally out from under that debt of that property. Because I was, for 10 years, I'd been getting calls from the bank because she wasn't paying the bill. I, and I informed her. I said, look, I'm not going to pay you child support. I'm not going to pay you alimony. I'm not going to pay for the house. You wanted this. I didn't. You don't want to fight me on this. You don't want to fight me on this. And she didn't. She knew better. So we settled. And then, uh, again, like I said, I took me a while to find my way. I rented a house on the other side of town. The landlord decided to sell the house. I couldn't buy it. I couldn't afford to buy it. I was working at a hardware, making $9 an hour and doing DJ gigs. Not a lot of DJ gigs. So anyway, there uh, in lies my problem. I had to find a new place to live. And I couldn't afford anything in this town. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, my third and last love, because I'll never, I'll never fall in love again, um, told me I could move in with her. And within three months, that was over. <laughs> I don't want to cast blame or or accept blame but it was over and done no more eh. I decided to leave town and go back home and home back down state moved in with mom and dad at the time dad was still kicking and I spent the winter down there and hated it so I came back up here and lived on my boat. I lived in my boat. 22-foot Cuddy Cruiser. Not much space. Boat and a duffel bag. This beautiful home I have is not really... I mean, it's a home. It's not a house. It's a trailer. Everybody in the neighborhood here calls their trailers a house. Uh, they're homes. They're not houses. I never wanted to live in a trailer. Never wanted to live in a trailer. But when I found this place, it was a wreck, and I rehabbed it from end to end, top to bottom, gutted it, and uh, redid it. And that was great therapy after my uh, last final breakup with that girl who will remain nameless. But uh, I licked my wounds, got back up on that horse... Rehabbed the house, sold the boat, because I couldn't keep my boat here. And then I started having some issues. I broke some ribs skiing, tore ACL on my knee, um, enlarged prostate, bleeding in the bladder, heart attack, had a scooter crash. And then, working on my house here, I fell off a ladder and severed my elbow joint. A lot of crap happening. And that was probably three or four years ago, four years ago. But uh, between the, my music gigs, which are non-existent now since COVID, 
I do have music friends. I've got some uh, retired professional musicians who live in the area that uh, have become my friend, friends. And, and a shout out to a few of my other friends. Jim Lips. I'm just going to say Lips. I don't want to give away your real name. Hey Lips, how you doing? And uh, Jim and Kelly. Bill and Bird. Burke and D. Barb and Dennis. Crazy Cat Lady. These are my friends. They're important people in my life. Without them, life would suck. It took many years here in my home to discover the difference between lonely and alone. I'm alone. But lonely, you can't be lonely when you have good friends. You, you just can't do it. So now I'm doing that thing called searching for contentment. I guess I've been doing that for a long time. I'm doing that all my life. <laughs> I bought a kayak. I bought a trailer for my kayak. Yeah, it's a big kayak. And then I started rigging it. <laughs> it's a big kayak. Did I mention that? It's a fishing kayak. And uh, I've influenced Crazy Cat Lady. Now she has a kayak. And we go kayaking together. We're not in love. We're not in love. We're just friends. We're not going there. So, so that w was a form of contentment for these six short months of summer usable warmer weather but then I lost my son no he didn't die he changed his last name to his mother's last name with no good explanation but it, it wasn't a real terrible loss because he hardly ever communicated with me anyway and I, I'm not sure why I'm not sure why. When my dad died, I told him, don't even bother worrying about coming to the funeral. In fact, we really didn't even have one. We had a memorial. These birds are noisy. And then, my daughter uh, ghosted me. Don't take my calls. Doesn't return texts. Completely ghosted me. Without explanation. So I had to chew on this. I had to chew on the, the my son, my dad, my daughter. And, you know, you have to, at some point, you got to let go of stuff. Because it'll eat you alive. I don't know why. I can't chew on it. I'm going to go kayaking today. I'm going to go fishing with Sherry. Sorry, crazy cat lady. <laughs> and I'm not going to chew on the things in life that might affect my emotions. You can't, it's just a feeling. You know, when you forget about it, you know, my heart is so broken. I think I'll have a piece of cheesecake. Mmm, that's good cheesecake. <laughs> Where'd my broken heart go? I, I can't do it. I think I'm going to write a song. Where'd my broken heart go? <laughs> I can do that. Look, my mom's still around. My brothers. I've kind of reconnected with them. Uh, closer. To my two brothers, Rick and Dan, more than ever. Even though we still don't talk a lot, we talk more than we used to. Um, and that makes up for some of the neighbors 
in my... I'm sandwiched between neighbors. And, uh... I'm not sure how to deal with them. I just deal with them the best I can. So, in the meantime, I like to go camping, kayaking, and making YouTube videos. I love cooking, cleaning, like to uh, grow plants, smoke a little reefer, drink a little booze, make a little love, get down tonight, mm -mm -mm -mm, get down tonight. Um, but I'm trying to find a way out of here, this part of the area. Uh, I feel stuck. Summer's too short. Winter's too long. And I look at RV life, and I think, what is RV life? Is it traveling around the nation with a truck and a camper, with a bunch of other people with trucks and campers? I don't really want to do that. I would like to find a small piece of property here, small piece of property down in the south somewhere where it's warm, split my time between the two. I don't want to, I don't want to congregate with a group of people. I'm doing that here in a trailer park. I don't want this. So, uh, am I, what is it, searching for contentment? A fool's errand? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not searching for contentment. I'm making strides toward being content or more contented. So, what do I do? What do you think? Where do I go? What do you think? How do I live? What do you think? Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Leave me a comment. Maybe check that PayPal link out and buy me a beer. That's all I got for now. Now you know a little bit more about me, Dr. Kayak.